Well, I remember yeah. Chris when he was a graduate student. In fact, we first met at a conference in Stockholm, That's right. I'm pretty sure, I or somewhere was... in Sweden. Oh, yo, it was in Juvla. Yeah. Uh, where uh, his dissertation was on combining two different methods of valuing things that people were arguing about which was better. One was called hedonics, one's called repeat sales, and he put them together into one. And he's become very well known for econometric method evaluation, but also before sort of the intersection of valuing things in urban form and how to think about how the location of one place influences the valuation of another place. And as such, he is um, uh, very well versed in why cities have evolved the way <laughs> that they do, and it's what he spends a lot of time thinking about. He is also a master teacher. I, I, will, I, I wrote to you, actually, Spencer, too. I was on a trip with 12 of our master students in Asia about a month ago. And at dinner one night, when the students had had enough to drink that they were being completely <laughs> honest, uh, they talked about what amazing teachers these guys were. And you got a flavor of that with Spencer, of course. And you'll see it now with Chris. So Chris, thank you for doing thank this. You. And take it away. Richard asked if I could help out with the PRIA Institute. And I said yes, because I had given a talk at PRIA a couple of years ago and had a great time. And the people were fantastic. And it was a really interesting conversation. So I said yes. And I thought, for sure, I'd be moderating a panel and be fun, because I'd ask questions and not have to do any work. Um, and then about 10 days ago, uh, I looked at the program to figure out what I was talking about. And Richard had slotted me in for an hour talk on the future of cities. <laughs> And that's a giant topic that would take all semester. And I didn't know how I was going to do that 50 minutes. And then underneath that, there were two other questions about the, the long run persistence in urban form and what happens with it. With the uh, things that had happened 100 years ago could shape the urban form today. So he's basically, you know, he basically handed me months of work <laughs> and shoved it into 50 minutes. So I got 37 slides of kind of taken this whole topic and tried to cram it in. Into, in a short amount of time. So I've got a lot of slides to get through. The primary driver here, I think, is that, um, I think, uh, Gloria, you talked about herd mentality. No, it was you. Uh, Cindy, you talked about herd mentality. And I think that's true of real estate. It's uh, a lot of herd mentality. It's because it's hard to know the truth, right? Those are opaque assets, and they don't trade very frequently, so it's hard to know. So we count on each other to, to glean information from. The other thing we do is we are very much focused on the present. So we talk about whatever's burning right now is the thing that's going to cause all the topics, right? And so that's what I, what I want you guys to do for, for the next hour is see whether or not you can sort of begin to open your perspective a little bit to think about how long things last, right? So, you know, real estate lives as a long-lived asset. And it's funny, we think about investing over seven to 10 years for this group. Um, other people do it for three to five years and they flip something, get out of it. Um, but the buildings, most of the buildings that we have now were built a long time ago. The cities that we live in today were established hundreds of years ago. The system of cities that work around the world were set, established many, many hundreds of years ago. So we have this industry that is entirely based on durability and we think about it very, very locally and very present. Okay, so I think that's what I want you to kind of stretch out of that one. So I got a bunch of pictures to motivate that process and we'll see how far we get. But these are my questions that Richard asked me to kind of think about is how has Los Angeles evolved over time? And I think that's an interesting conversation. And again, there's a lot, a lot of history on LA. We talk about that one. Um, and then the settlement patterns, I think, is super interesting because it's just abundantly clear. I'm going to show you some pictures in a second. How just how, how clear it's been. Like the path for LA has been laid out a long time ago. So, right? we, and, you know, again, our industry is about change. We think about investing and changing and changing and changing. So we think about change. Most things aren't changing. Okay. The topics for this institute are housing, capital markets, transportation, politics, governance, and technology. And this is the same list that occurs every single time, right? So these, these things come up every day. So it's topical, but within the bins, they change from face to face. So like technology, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking about autonomous vehicles. Right now, we're talking about AI. So like the lens changes, but the topics stay the same. Um, in terms of hot topics over time, kind of working backwards in time, um, I think public, I had a long conversation yesterday with an office investor. And he was talking about you know, when he's going to get back in and buy office buildings again. Um, and the issue he kept bringing up was he thinks that the public finance is going to be a hot mess because of all the valuations that were being coming down. Right? So over the next couple of years, as tax assessments come down, tax revenue comes down, there's going to be a bunch of cities that are going to cap it. So that's going to be an issue we're going to talk about next year, probably. Um, but in terms of like working backwards chronologically, we have um, you know, this retail death spiral here in San Francisco. Homelessness has been an issue before that. Inflation and persistent inflation was, was, was a big issue. Working from home, and then we had COVID itself. Before that, we had end of retail. Before that, we had corporate ownership of single family residential. So you, you can see, see this lens, it keeps moving backwards, right? There's always some hot topic. And what I want you guys to do is to think a little bit 
more broadly about this. And the thing is that all of those issues, which are real and have huge impacts for all of us as investors and owners and, and developers, um, they all happen within a larger context. Right? So they all happen within a larger context, and that's what this is. Okay, so let's talk about long run persistence first. This is one of my favorite maps. This is from 1915. It's an um, uh, auto club of Southern California map. Um, and what I want you to see there is all the names that are here now are basically where all the places are in LA right now. Right? All the major metropolitan, all the employment centers in Los Angeles right now in the metropolitan area are on this map. Everyone, everyone agree with that one? Right, so Long, you know, so, uh, Long Beach is there. Uh, Newport Beach is significant down there. Santa Ana, Irvine's just showing up over there. Riverside, San Bernardino's over there. So all the places we think of being the sub-centers within the metropolitan area of Los Angeles are already there in 1915. Okay, so it's well over 100 years ago. Okay, um, move forward uh, 30 years now. So at this point, um, cars are ubiquitous. Um, we have lots of streets, we have lots of cars. It's 1944 now, we've uh, grown up. Uh, manufacturing has, has really exploded here in California, especially because of aerospace and the World War II. So the world's completely changed, but this set of roads here was inherited essentially from places that were existed 30 years ago. Okay, so this set of roads are here as of, as of 1944, kind of lay things out. And you guys, were, if you were from LA, kind of start to see these streets already. So like up to the north, for instance, the La Crescentia, uh, uh, Sunland up there, that basically becomes the 210. So you can kind of see the, the, the future on the map in 1944. Okay, so what I did here, and I'm gonna go through a bunch of pictures now, is the question I asked in this, in this picture was simply, how much, if I wanted to explain where jobs were in, in all of the LA metropolitan area, what could I use for that one? I think most urban economists would say, well, let's start with the CBD, the downtown, and we'll go distance from there, and we'll have a de you know, declining gradient from there, and that's true. There is a gentle degradient de from downtown out the outside there. But there's 45 to 50 sub-centers in LA, in the metropolitan area, that are really significant. Santa Ana, Culver City, uh, Century City, and there's lots of places that have nodes outside of it. So if I wanted to know where people were using just a simple set of maps, what would I use here? And people would go immediately to the 2000 highway system and say, well, this is, transportation allows us to get around, and so the intersections of the major highways are gonna be the places that should explain where people are, right? And that's the, if you see the blue triangle here, that's this one right here. So this, what this map says, this figure says, is that um, in miles from my significant places, so I took the map I just showed you and took all those place names on it and said, these are places now, I'm gonna put them here and then take distance from them and accumulate all the, the jobs. So. This says that if I go two miles from, uh, this is up here, so if I go four miles from the places on the map that I call significant, then it explains 90% of the employment. So it's in interesting, right? So the thing that's most interesting about this one is that the map that is the, the most accurate to explain where current employment is in LA, at least as of 2010, I gotta update this, um, is 1915. That first map I showed you does a better job of explaining where employment is in LA right now than the current highway system does. And that's a little bit of a surprise, I think, right? It just shows you how persistent these are. Once you put uh, a sub-center in one place, if you're gonna add a new building, where do you put your building? Around other buildings, right? And so if you wanna put office building, what's that? Where the jobs are. Where the jobs are, right? Um, it turns out also it's also where it's an easier to get entitlements to build things, so we'll show you that in a second slide. But from a, uh, I told Spencer I didn't have very many figures, I said just one regression here, but. What this says is, this, this regression is just a couple things to look at this one. This says, what I wanted to do is I ran the density, the number of jobs per acre in, in a census tract as a function of the same census tract 10 years before and 20 years before. So ED00 is the employment density in 2000, and I ran that versus the density in 90 and density in 80. And so you can just sort of see the numbers here, the important ones are these big ones, are, are this one. This is 90%. So if I wanted to do, explain where employment was today, using just one other number, I would take the data from 10 years ago, and even though those were really busy 10 years, lots of changes happened in that area. We had tech change, we had employment change, we had demanufacturing, we had lots of things happen in LA during these 20 year periods. If I want to explain where jobs were today, I would just look at where they were 10 years ago and then here 20 years ago, okay? And the, the thing about this, what I like about this picture is that within the centers, we have a lower R squared, we do a bit less, you know, less successful at explaining variation in employment, as we do outside of this stuff. And this is gonna be another one of my points I'm gonna to try to make today is that LA has a lot of persistence. There's a bunch of things that happen over time in LA that are gonna say over and over and over again and stay the same. But we all know LA's changed a lot, right? So LA is probably the most dynamic metropolitan area in the United States, maybe in the world. 
depending on how you measure dynamism, but we've added tons of jobs, we've added tons of people, different ethnicities. It's been a huge churning pot of, of change. Um, and that's mostly occurred inside the centers. And so outside the centers, and again, I've got centers defined the way I define them. I'll, I can talk about that if we have more time later. But outside the centers, there's not a lot of change. And that's a point I'm going to show next. OK. All right, so shock ossification. So with that in mind, we have this long-term persistence occurring, right? And you guys saw the map from 1915, and you could use that to get around and find jobs today, right? OK. Um, so but we know there's lots of change here. So let's see what change looks like. So this is a map of 1940, and this is a racial and ethnic breakdown of people in, in uh, LA as of 1940 using the US Census. So the kind of gold, orange colors are, are, are whites. Um, the green is Asian. There are some dots for Asian. Um, the, black, the blue is the African American, and the red is Hispanic. So this is as of 1940. Going forward 20 years to 1960, you know, lots of change. Lots of change happening here. And then by 2000, a lot of change. Right? So I don't think anyone's going to say that places have stayed the same here. But I just said a minute ago that things kind of stayed the same. So what's happening? This is, and I, I picked out a couple cities to demonstrate and compare this with, um, with Los Angeles. Here's Los Angeles here. So this is the rank correlation. So with the, the, the last set of pictures show these guys are census tracts, and they have uh, counts of, of population by race and ethnicity. And it had a rank correlation. So I said, Every place that has is, is ranked in terms of its percentage of whites, uh, percentage of blacks, percentage of Hispanics, and just had the ranks and said, are these ranks persistent over time? And so in that last picture, you sort of showed there was the growth of the African-American population in South LA and South Central LA. Um, there was up in San Fernando and out in um, Northwest Pasadena was one concentration. And that kind of grew there. The Hispanic population was in East LA. It's centered there and really expanded farther west and, and uh, south. Um, but kind of everywhere. And then the Asian community sort of popped up in Monterey Park and other places out there. So there was change here. And what this it shows here is that the rank correlations are not very high. So the Hispanic corp are not very high here. Places like Bridgepoint, I put that here. This Bridgepoint's in, um, a place that doesn't change very much. It's very inert. And so it's got high persistence here. But other places that are more dynamic, like Las Vegas, have very low correlations. So those are places that have been churning and actually changing quite a bit. OK. But that's just with black, white, and Hispanic. If you take a look at other elements of what's changing or staying, this is going to be stability within change. Is that we have density now? This is number of people per acre. Um, education. This is the rank of education. So this is uh, graduate school, uh, college graduate, some some graduate, high school graduate, not high school graduate. Um, house price we know about and income. And I took their rank persistence over time. So I think this is super interesting. So as you saw on the maps, people were changing. The race and ethnicities were changing of the neighborhoods. But the ranks of incomes, house prices, and education were all very constant. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that when an African-American person got a raise and had a higher education person, they could move into another neighborhood that had a like education, like uh, human income, like, like house price. And so people were moving around inside. But the neighborhood levels were staying the same. So Beverly Hills was the rich place 100 years ago, and it's always been ranked in the top one or two. Um, and so that persistence is what I'm after there. So people move inside and outside of it. So their race and ethnicity might change. The family size might change. But the hierarchy of house, the neighborhoods within them have been relatively constant. So, and again, I think given the, this number, I find just stunning. This is over 40 years. And you guys know how much LA has changed over 40 years to find that that's 85%. Education's 80%, and income's almost 75%, just over 75%. It's a stunning amount of persistence, I think. Remember, is the reason Las Vegas and Charlotte are, have very little persistence just because they've exploded so much in size? Yes, and I got a picture to show you Houston. Um, but I think what's happening is this is pervasive. And so I'm, I'm going to try to pivot to a more general statement about cities. Is we're finding affordability being a problem in the United States these days more broadly. It's been in California for a long time. New York's been expensive. But we're finding that. I think I'm finding anyways, is that cities are becoming more and more sclerotic. It's getting harder and harder to build housing, and I got a reason for that here. But this persistence is part of that. OK. Um, so to Richard's question, what's happened here? And so what I did is I took Houston and Los Angeles and then said, well, we know over a long time, from 70 to 2000, 2010, we have one kind of rank. But how did, that, how did it arrive at that overall change? What happened year by year? So let's do um, LA first. LA has. 90, 93, 95, 94. And what I did with the underline here, these are the only, these are the periods in which uh, the rank stability went down by a significant amount, by 3% or more. 
So each year from 70 to 80, 80 to 90, 90 to 2000, 2000 to 2010, the persistence got higher. Okay, so everyone understand here, like, even though we're going through this period of product change, the more people we get in a place, the more it matures, the more it settles into a pattern that stays it's stuck. Okay? So this is, in 1970, LA was already very, built, very much built out. I mean, there's lots of, there are lots of houses that were added there, but the, sort of the basic layout of the LA basin was kind of laid out. It had a high persistence, and so it stayed high and, and got higher, actually. Some of these numbers are extraordinary, like 98% here. But Houston's a place that was much smaller when we start the data. Uh, lots of rural land on the outside and lots of new neighborhoods that were being born, and they were born at different price points. And so you could actually go and start a working class neighborhood, you can go start a, a high end neighborhood, right, depending on what the developer wanted to do. So here in 1970, you get things like 60%, but then it goes to 90, 93, up to 90%. Uh, income persistence is you know, 60% here to 80 to 89 up to here. So, the, so what's happening here, even in a place like Houston, which is, again, one of these places that's grown really, really rapidly. It's accommodated a ton of people. Uh, percentage basis has grown faster than LA by a long shot. But um, it's gotten more and more per persistent over time. All right, so what does this mean? Um, uh, this is true. Again, the, the, the race and ethnicity variables have also changed quite a bit. So the, we, I showed you earlier that Houston had a low overall from, 80 to, from 1970 to 2010. But that difference really was borne out early in the birth, birth, kind of the maturing years. Once it settles into a pattern, it's still very persistent. So again, we're seeing rising, I call it ossification. The system is getting more and more established and mature, and it's getting stuck. Um, all right, so what does this mean? So for house prices, and again, I, I, I'd love to do more on commercial data, but the data is rare and hard to get to come by. But this is just a simple picture of house prices in LA County, or LAMSA. Um, and I just took the data in 2000. Uh, took all the zip codes, took the median house price in each zip code, and then binned it. And I did it by four, six, eight. I showed you one here for eight lines here, I think, eight bins. And the, the idea is like house prices have gone up everywhere in LA, right? Okay, but the places that were in the lowest group in 2000 are still the lowest group here 20 years later. So this is despite the housing bubble and bust. Uh, the rise of the 1%, you know, all, the, you know, all these things that have caused display, you know, uh, fraying a little bit of the distribu income distribution in the country. House prices have remained within their bin. So the upper tier has outperformed relative to the others. Uh, it started with a big lead and it grew faster, um, but they never crossed. So you can do this for 10 groups or 15 groups, whatever, whatever you start, it's very persistent. So while gentrification has become kind of a really big industry word for us, it doesn't actually mean that lots have changed. So, Gentrification is, is a thing, it does happen, but it's largely within a larger context of a great deal of stability. All right. Is, is this LA County or the MSA? Or this is the, the this, I'm sorry, this is, this is LA County and uh, Ventura and Orange County. I didn't have San, Riverside and San Bernardino. It doesn't change much if I do that. No, I'm yeah. just curious yeah. about uh, looking at magnitudes, because I, you know, on the gentrification stuff, it's still the cheapest stuff in 2010 was like, what, 200,000, and now it's over half a million. Right, and so that is actually averaged out in this one, right? So I mean, there's some neighborhood for which it did start at a low point and then crossed into a higher point, but it, it was an exception. So of all the houses, all the neighborhoods that had the same starting point, they average out to be that. So there are certainly, gentrification is real, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it's rare to have a neighborhood completely reorient its rent right I, within the neighborhood. I guess I'm saying something a little different, which is it's like all of LA County has gentrified because of the cheapest house is half a million dollars. <laughs> well, yeah, we can go that route. <laughs> right. Ultimately, we all gentrified, right? Um, okay, but anyways, my, my point here is in persistent. The, the idea was to talk about long-term persistence. And so because we focus heavily on short-term change and short-term shocks, there's this larger context. This is, I think, r remarkable, and this is true in DC, it's true in Chicago, it's true in Sweden. It just, once you establish a mature housing market and have its sort of neighborhood established, it's really hard to dislodge it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about how that occurs here again. We talked about LA changing quite a bit, and Houston's changed quite a bit, and how have they accommodated growth despite what appears to be st in this sort of great stability? So um, this is, uh, I like this picture quite a bit, this is the, um, this is the uh, per capita new units uh, over time. Uh, the green line is uh, United States, and then the blue line is California. And so from 1970 to 1990, every time there was a housing cycle in the United States, California had one also, and it built a lot more housing than the rest of the country on a per capita basis. And this is how California became so populated, right? So it went from, at the beginning of this period, went from, I think, um, 
8% of the US population was in California, and then by the 1990, it was 12%. So it had outperformed. Everyone says, well, you can't build in California, but for many, many decades in California, it was much, much better at building housing than the rest of the country. Okay, so, but as of 1990, it shifts, and we can talk about why 1990 is an inflection year, but after that, California then no longer kept up. So it kind of lagged behind the rest of the country. So it's still pro-cyclical the way the US is, but it didn't build as many houses. All right, so this is, this red line is California's decline. This is the, this is why we're having an affordability issue here is because we're just less elastic. So prices are going up and we're not building as much stuff. Uh, but that's true everywhere now. The yellow line here is like, you know, everyone says, well, you, you know, everyone's leaving California because it's so easy to build somewhere else. And it's not true anymore. It's getting hard to build everywhere. All right, so this is an awful map, but this is the best I could do. I tried a bunch of different colors to make this more visible, but walk me through here. So this is the share of new net units. So from 1970 to 1980, we built a bunch of houses in the LA basin, and I just plotted their share. So where, where were the number of units? If you were gonna build 100 houses, where do those shares appear? And you can sort of see that in 1970, 1980, we were still suburbanizing. And so and to Richard's point, I didn't have Riverside and, and uh, uh, San Bernardino out there. So I, I've truncated it here, but you can sort of see most of the data, so the green here is about zero here. So the green is sort of some infills occurring here. Like this whole area is going through you know, building out infill, uh, building up master plan development, all the way down here to the south here. So most of the most of the new supply that was added during that decade occurred in the periphery. So very much suburbanization, a mature suburb, suburban growth. Okay, this is from 2010 to the best data I've got, 2015, 2018. Um, and you can sort of see, like, we're not doing the same thing we used to, right? The way we add housing now is much through more infill, and you guys know this, right? We're doing many more multifamily. Many, many more share of the units being built now are multifamily versus single family detached. And that means what? That means building in the core areas where people want amenities. Okay, so this pocket, which was at zero, dead zero for 70 to 80, is amongst the biggest builder of housing here. Uh, we got here in Highland Park and north of um, downtown, we got downtown itself. Um, and there are other places like out here in Pasadena that we're not building anything <laughs> during that period. So there are places where we have stopped development in some places and other places we're adding it here. But I think the, the picture I want to bring across here is we fundamentally changed the way we build. Suburban building versus infill building. Okay, what does that mean for us? Higher cost. It's much more expensive on a per square foot basis to build a tower or a five over two than it is to build single family detached home on a, on a, on a uh, uh, greenfield lot, lot sought. Okay, so that's LA. And then this is the part I wanna get across about sclerosis occurring across other places, not just California. We think, we already know California is a hard place to build, but this is Houston. And we're gonna walk it through decade by decade here. So this is 1970, 1980. And you can sort of see here, where did the share of new units get built in Houston? Again, lots of construction occurring here. It's all out here. So this is the inner ring suburbs establishing Houston. You all good? Okay, so Houston from 1970 to 1980, 1980 to 1990, 1990 to 2000. You guys see the pattern? It's really abundantly clear. We're just going out. There's just lots of green, there's green fields out there. And so you can go, go to a farmer and buy a lot, subdivide it, put some houses in, okay? Um, regulation's really easy, the land was available, and so it was easy to build houses. And so they just kept going out. The share keeps going out, the purple dots keep going further out. Okay, but as of 2010, it starts to pause. It doesn't seem to have the same momentum it had before. And then here, this last one, again, I would call this a little bit more chaotic. I'm not seeing a clear pattern here, but if we're, the green here is sort of, this is growth. You see all the infill that's occurring here? Now, I don't have the map here. I didn't, I think they had time to do more slides, but Houston's also building a lot more multifamily than it used to. So its share of new units are being built in five or more units is rising. And along with that is higher cost there as well. Okay, so, why is this happening? So um, this is, again, this is, I love this picture. <laughs> My co-author hates this one. Um, we'll walk you through this one. This is, what I'm trying to capture with this one is I'm trying to show um, the ossification, the, 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 the rigidness emerging over time. So the, let's do this, 1970, 1980. So this is from 1970 to 1980. This is the growth here. So this is the, the distribution of census tracts that were adding housing, okay? So over here, in 1970, there's a relatively flat distribution, a little wide distribution, a long tail here, so that you know, a lot of this half of the distribution um, meant that a lot of the tracks were participating in adding housing. So if you took it, if you looked around Houston, you know, over half of the tracks were actually adding new units, and significantly so. These are significant amounts of housing over here. So I took, it just means that lots of people, lots of neighborhoods were participating in adding supply, okay? So, but 
over time, you can see what happens here from the yellow line is the next one, and then there's the blue and green one. They get a little bit flipped here, but they start to pinch up here. This pink one is the last one. Again, it's a little bit, I don't want to oversell this picture too much because, of course, we're coming out of a recession at that point. The GFC ends at from in, in 2010. But you can sort of see here, this, is, this means that essentially the vast majority of census tracts in Houston aren't adding more supply. So we talk about it easy to build in Houston. There's no regulation. We can do whatever we want to do. The fact of the matter is that people aren't building lots of units across lots of different parts of the census, the, the, the community. Okay, so fewer and fewer members of, of the tracks are participating in growth. And I think this is where this next picture comes from, is our prices. And so I got blue is uh, Texas here, red is California. You can sort of see from, 2000, from 1995 to 2000 till, till the bubble started. House prices in California took off, and we were complaining about housing affordability. Uh, we weren't building enough stuff. House, we had a bubble the whole bit. Um, all that time, Houston was also growing rapidly. Its population was growing about the same rate as California during this time period, um, and its prices were really modest. And why is that? It's because they were able to build, right? Okay. Um, that last picture I showed you about the decline, about participating in, in growth, is this next picture. Because this is interesting to me. Oh, I mislabeled this. Sorry. This starts in, in 2014. Sorry, this is mislabeled. This, this, is, this is normalized at 2014. Um, house prices since 2014 are the same in Houston and the four metropolitan areas of um, Texas as the four largest four in, um, in California. So the blue lines are um, Texas, that's uh, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and Dallas. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and then in, in California, they are uh, LA, San Francisco, San Diego, and Sacramento. Okay. So do you guys see a difference here? I mean, the story, the story we're being told all the time is that people are leaving because it's so affordable in California. And it is on a price level basis. The levels are lower, but house price appreciation is rising rapidly there. Okay, so just as rapidly as it is here. And this is, I think, is because it's getting harder to build stuff there. And the other missing thing here, which I think is this picture, is the difference between supply about land and avail uh, uh, monetized land. So my last little sort of idea here is that People who can afford to build a new house also want other things. So I think in the era of the 70s, I mean, coming out of World War II, everyone just wanted a house. So we had Levittown, and we had these mass developments where people just wanted a house. They wanted to own their own home, be part of the American dream. I think now the incomes have shifted to the point now where people who can afford to build a new house actually want to be near a cafe, near a Whole Foods, near a Trader Joe's. And so you have to start mixing. There's lots of land that's available all over California. There's lots of land that's available in Houston and in Austin. But it turns out that the people who want to build new houses there don't want to be out in the periphery. They don't want to be just a house somewhere. They want to be, have a house. They want to have a unit they can own. They also want to be near other amenities, like a bookstore, a cafe, or something like this. So I've got one other set of slides here. And I'll stop here. <laughs> I love this one. So um, I'm looking for amenities. Um, the last idea here is that if we think about uh, where would you want to build a house, well, I, I, can, I, want, I want a certain size of house, and I certainly want a certain set of amenities. Where can I find the amenities? So, People say, well, yeah, well, so this is, this is my proxy. I've, I've tried a bunch of different things here, but this is my best proxy for amenities. So this is fast foods. Okay, so um, if you look at LA, so this is just the dot of all the fast food places. You can see they're everywhere, right? Everywhere there's people, there's fast food. So it's ubiquitous, right? Un, it's really not a distinguishing factor to say, oh, I'm near, I'm near uh, Carl's Jr., right? No one, oh, cool, right? No one ever says, like, that's not, no one markets for that. But if you look at non-chain restaurants, um, and I've tried other things, but I think this is my, my favorite single proxy for this, is you can kind of see that it's not evenly spaced, right? If you want to be a non-chain restaurant, I'm thinking about you know, the kind of places that you, know, you ate last night. Drago Centro is not a chain restaurant, right? So if you want to go to find a place. They have three, they have three restaurants. Three is OK. Our, our, so we're looking for non-chain is I was franchise. I <laughs> <laughs> But you can sort of see here, like the west side of LA is clearly the place you want to live, right? Where are house prices? Really expensive there, right? Okay, so as a developer, I would love to be able to build there, but land is expensive, right? So if we think about if I'm trying to build housing that's both uh, affordable for a home buyer, but also near amenities, my supply of available land is really limited. So while there may be lots of land at the periphery, it's not relevant. What I really care about is the supply of amenitized land, and those are places that are close to, have access to jobs, but also access to amenities. And so this is part of the reason I think that we're getting more sclerosis in LA is because the people who can afford to build housing, who can afford new housing, actually want to be there. And that's still too expensive, so we're not building enough stuff. But this is also true happening in, in Houston. And it's really happening in Austin. My favorite picture I, I didn't bring, because I thought I'd run out of time, um, is, uh, is Austin. 
And so Austin's a place that's really pretty small compared to LA. It's a, and the footprint is much, much smaller. And there's land really, you can drive to available land re readily, right? But the people who are moving to Austin over the last couple of years have really wanted to be right near where the action is. And so they don't want to live out there. And so house prices have risen in, in Austin just as fast as um, other places that are much more land constrained. Okay. Um, all right, so what's next? All right, so cities are this manifestation. Richard's question, you know, how does, how does um, LA's history sort of guide its future? And the thing is, it's abundantly clear. Once you start laying streets that connect nodes, then the streets actually act to make the nodes more valuable. So once you put a highway between Pasadena and downtown, it doesn't actually make them merge. It makes the two places that much more easy to get to. And so it actually enhances the two nodes. So the nodes we saw in the 1915 map once we put highways in, it just made it easier to get back and forth them, and the nodes got more valuable. So now I can actually access a bunch of different nodes using the freeway system. So it hasn't actually led to new development of nodes. There's a couple, but for the most part, all these new highways we built have enabled existing nodes to actually get bigger and denser. So that's the first level of persistence it starts with the old map and it says of highway systems. Um, uh, there are lots of shocks that are happening all the time, and you know, we, I had a long list at the beginning here, but and there's going to be more shocks, you know, by next week there'll be more shocks, and, and so on. They keep happening here. And what I want you guys to do is to think about those shocks within a larger context. And I think the best example of this is is working from home, and think back about other technology changes. So in um, in 1988, when I got my first email account, and there were articles about the death of space. Do you guys remember this, Carl? Yeah, we're all going to fly, fly, you know, fly fish in Michigan or in Montana and do our job on the internet. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what happened with you know since internet became available to sort of get in touch with anyone all the time anywhere in the world, what happened to cities in, since 1980? They got bigger and denser, right? So it turns out that most emails are actually within the same firm, within the same building, right? So we use the email all the time. We don't actually use it to escape each other. We actually use it to stay in touch with each other more more, more rapidly. Okay, so um, you know working from home is this interesting thing. I'm surprised. Like I guess. Um, you said that you didn't so much time talking about the death of office markets yesterday, right? Um, I'm just, I'm watching this group and getting together. I'm very, very sure the office market will bounce back. Like, how long will it take? I'm not sure which firms have to be together, but we're more productive as a group in person than we are, I'm sorry, if you guys did this all by Zoom, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun or as interesting. I'm sure of that, right? And so this is over time, high human capital people are gonna have to be spending more time together. Um, is it five days a week? Is it three days a week? I'm not sure here, but, but somehow cities are gonna remain very, very viable. The system of city is going to stay very, very important for real estate. And as we go forward, it may pivot more away from office and more to more amenity and housing. But that just places because they're more productive, more choices for restaurants, more choices for cultural activities, a whole bit. So I think that technology change, all that, all these changes are going to work their way through in a way that will end up reinforcing the existing system. Um, so uh, employment centers are very stable. Then change occurs within them more readily than, than across them or outside of them. Um, and yeah, so I'll stop there. I got one, I, got, I, I finished early, so let me finish two more things here. So let me, let me show about technology change. So I love this picture also. So other, other form, we talked about internet as a, a form of technology change. So like the, the first big shock I think to cities was what? It was cars, right? Okay, so this is a picture in New, in, in New York City. In, uh, this is 1900, and you see all the horses, right? There's actually a car there, can you find it? And you got big buildings, you got a major thoroughfare, lots of people, productive, dense place with horses. Um, what do cars do? They allow us to spread out more, right? Right, because we can, we can travel more distances, we can spend, right? So um, this, is, this is the picture 13 years later. Now this is back in a period when technology change was very slow, it's faster now, but this is still just a decade later. What do you see? No horses, right? There's actually one horse. It's right there, okay? So um, what's that? Yeah, so my point in this is that this, the buildings are still there, right? The technology changed and allowed the people to move and live differently, perhaps. But the city is still there. It's still a dense place. It's still a productive place. And the technology has allowed that to be more reinforced. Okay, so I think technology change is not going to be the, the, uh, the death knell of cities. Um, and then my last picture is this one. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but it, it, at some point, every city seems to go through a period when they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, um, they're going to, uh, cities are going to decline and collapse. So we had, you know, Richard and, and some of the older people were like, you remember when New York City was bust, right? And Ford, Ford told New York, Ford dropped New York dead, yeah. Dropped dead, right? So New York was going to disappear. And where's New York now? Most expensive 
land in the United States, right? Okay, lots of tall new buildings, luxury, 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 right? So it's, it's a fantastically big productive place. Um, Amazon, this was after uh, Boeing had moved some plant or something, they closed something, I forget what happened that caused this, but they were very sure that Amazon was gonna go, I mean that uh, Seattle was gonna go away. So this is an actual billboard that was up there and it's kind of infamous and so, of course some smart ass on the internet did this. Um, but anyway, so that's my point. So what I want you guys to do now is the valuation issue is something I stayed away from in my talk. So certainly the value of these things is going to fluctuate, right? We're seeing that now with interest rates changing quite a bit, um, where risk is, where debt is, the whole bit. So there is a sort of sense that the valuation of the assets that are there is going to change. That's a different conversation. But for right now, all I'm going to talk about is just how much persistence there is. And I think that over time, the market we see now is going to be very similar going forward and maybe just Flavors of change, not drastic change. All right, there you go. Questions? So yesterday there was a talk on the intractable problem of affordable housing and specifically in LA. So given that talk and what you're saying now, sort of like how LA transforms to like this long persistence over time. So that would almost imply that like the affordable housing to solve it, you have to overcome this sort of like long persistence of development that sort of led to the issue now. So like, what would your recommendation be to like chat, yeah, sort so of I, overcome that persistence? Yeah, so I think the, um, again, we've been we're open to a much larger conversation here, but like, you, I think we provided a lot of affordable housing through something called filtering. So all of in that picture, those pictures of Houston where we had a, lots of housing in the suburbs and then in the exurbs and the further, so those pictures, every time someone left downtown to go to the near suburbs, they left a house behind that was depreciated, right? And then when that person had higher income, they wanted a bigger house, they moved out, they left the house behind. So the number of units were, were growing because we built a lots of new housing for houses that had higher income and higher preferences, better preference, different preferences. Um, and now what's happened is the, the, the lack of amenities at the periphery mean that, those, that we don't have this continuing cycle of moving further and further out, leaving houses behind for people. And so it's quite the opposite actually, is you know, uh, Blackstone you know, comes to L LA to invest and they invest in value add, right? They don't actually do new construction. So they actually take older stuff, instead of filtering it down into lower and lower kind of quality to make it more and more affordable, it actually goes the other direction. So we've actually, instead of spreading out, leaving units behind for people, we're actually moving in and, and destroying the affordable housing part. So, and I don't think that more supply, or more uh, subsidies are the answer because we need more supply. I, I, kind of a broken record on that one. But my pictures show about, about the way the market works is if the government could somehow coordinate providing more amenities, maybe you could get more supply being built at the periphery, right? And that's it's interesting, I haven't thought this through as a, I'm not making a poly prescription yet, but if it seems like if the only way to get a market developer to build something is to find a high enough income person to build it, and that person needs amenities, then they're only gonna do infill and luxury stuff, then that's a problem for us for long-term supply, right? And so I think that somehow we need to coordinate to get more amenities built elsewhere so that people are happy living other places. Yeah. Uh, hi, so terrific presentation. Thanks for your time today. I'm one of those people who racked my brains, or my brain, a lot about climate change. And, you know, I keep thinking, well, where in the Midwest, southern Canada am I going to go and build? And I come up with nothing, so I stay here. And, and I'm wondering, listening to you, and then thinking back on Matt. So Matt Kahn yeah, spoke right. yesterday, so you know he's a, he has views on this. If you were guessing, other than you know, strange outcomes like Phoenix and no water, do you think we technologically solve in the cities we're in? And so I don't have to worry about moving somewhere in the upper Midwest or southern Canada, or how do you see that playing, given uh, the persistence of cities? Oh, God. Um, so, that's a, so I left climate out because it was going to open a can of worms. It was going to be big and complicated. Um, so it is funny. I think the persistence issue is one because I've just been arguing that things kind of get stuck, right? We have these centers. So, but there are these cities that could disappear, right? right? So Miami's like top of my list because one hurricane and no insurance means no real estate in the longer term, right? So Phoenix is I'm, I'm not worried about water as much as I'm worried about, um, I'm sorry, I'm worried about water, but like, uh, I think last year or the year before that, there were seven days you couldn't fly an airplane there because it was too hot. You can't really have a first world market if you can't take a plane off. And if that, the, the forecasts were for 50 days of, of no flying there. So if you can't fly in the summer at all in Houston, I mean, in, in Phoenix, it doesn't really become a primary market, right? So there's other reasons to worry about that. Um, but I am kind of an optimist and I used to be an engineer. And I just feel like the EV, I've, I, you know, I gave a talk to a pre-group, or no, NAP group, 
um, to talk about climate change, and all they want to talk about was drones. So I was thinking about technology change. Like EVs are going to fundamentally change things. We're getting cleaner very fast, and the S curve is working its way up. So I think carbon capture is. I think someone's going to figure it out. I just I'm not yet to give up. I have kids. Maybe that's it. I'm just not ready to say that we're into catastrophe yet. So I think so there's hope for a technology change. So that's a little bit. I would maybe trust Matt in that one. Um, but I do think places like Phoenix, and I think you know. Houston is a place that's going to get a lot wetter, and I, don't, I just don't understand why anyone would, would move there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I get the lower price, but like in the end, the mosquitoes are big, the weather's tough, and the hurricanes are, hurricanes are going to get worse. So yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah. it's, a hard, so it's, it's, a hard. Hard. it's a big one, yeah. Uh, I have a prognosticating question. There seems to be natural barriers to expansion of cities, looking at your Houston map. Um, Fast forward LA to 15 million people. Where do they go? Do, oh, does so, LA look like six New York cities in different nodes? Or? Well, I don't know. But you, you know, the map I showed up there in, in 1915 had, I don't know, what was the population in 1915, do you think? Oh, well, 1920 is when the city crossed a million. million right. Okay, so, so in 1915, the, that whole area was probably about, given how fast it was, let's just say it was about a million. Yeah, okay. So I think, it, I, you know, the right way to think about LA is it's very polycentric, right? And so it's in some ways very, it's a very flexible form for adding population because a place like Riverside can mature into its own node, right? We have infrastructure, freeway infrastructure, we have uh, train infrastructure, um, and we already have places that are set up to actually accommodate growth. And I think that a kind of shared growth model where you have a polycentric place, I don't think LA's gonna look that much different. I bet you could add four million people and not really think of it as being fundamentally different. But what it mean is you'd have to have uh, eight-story buildings and move to 12-story buildings, right? And you'd have to, you know, so this is one of these things I feel like the, the landscape is actually set up for this right now. We already are big, we're many, many centers, and they could accommodate growth. I don't know, readily is the wrong word, but well, I would rather. And, it, and it's happening. So, it's happening, yeah. you know, nationally, employment is up 40% since 1990, and the Inland Empire, which is San Bernardino and Riverside counties, it's up by um, 150%. Yep. So, and Riverside is actually starting to become a real place. place yeah. I mean, it still needs to be more amenitized than yeah. it is. San Bernardino is a, is a problem. Yeah. But Ontario is becoming a place. Yeah. I mean, a, a pla Ontario sort of Rancho Cucamonga, that area. And nobody's even, like, if, it's a trivia question. If you ask people the 10 largest MSAs in the U.S., okay, well, the, the way I like to ask it, what's the largest MSA in the U.S. without a professional sports team, without a major league team? That's no, pretty small. Oh, it, it's, I just told you, it's the Inland Empire, which yeah. is considered a separate <laughs> metro. It's San Bernardino, Riverside County, which is almost 5 million people yeah. out there. There's lots of capacity out there for growth. Right. And it's not, I mean, it's changed. It used to be all those people would commute in. Yep. And they're not anymore. There are jobs out there that they're going to. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's your, my, I, would, I, would, I would imagine that we just, we were polycentric. That map I showed you is the same road map we'd add 4 million people to. It just means a little, slightly higher density kind of all over the place. Pasadena is one of these places that's added a lot of apartment buildings, and you wouldn't really notice the grossly. I mean, don't you think it's gotten more apartments, but it's gotten probably some more restaurants, but Old Town is still Old Town, and it's still kind of congested. Yeah, we still don't have remotely enough housing in Pasadena. Yeah, but. yeah fair enough, but we're building more. Um, anyways, go ahead. Next one. Carl. So I'm a native, and uh, onto the herd mentality, one statistic that was missing was the crime rate through those periods. And what the crime rate, unfortunately, I have citizen on my phone and I have to silence it at night. And I no longer go to a restaurant of my choice wherever, whenever I want. Um, you know, the, the, the effect on the psyche, getting off a freeway off-ramp and seeing what you see. And, and I'm hearing it from tenants. Uh, yesterday, we enjoyed a nice dinner. The day before, that entire block was locked down because of a police issue, and we had to evacuate our building. So when, how does, when do we get a handle on this, because I, I don't think anything's going to, one out of every three floors now of office space is vacant in downtown, right. and those that are occupied 
have about a 40 to 50 percent elevator swipe ratio of people actually in them. Yeah. So when, so when you does guys are, crime... You guys are asking all the easy questions, right? Climate change, homelessness, right? <laughs> well, just cri I think crime should be part of that vocabulary. For sure. And we talk about amenities, like safety is an amenity, right? And so, yeah, so amenities I mean, have to. But I don't know, I feel like New York City in 1970 was a much, much more violent place than here. Like, I, we, you know, we have this sort of local... We're, things have changed and gotten worse over the last couple, couple of years, for sure. But we're still way better than it used to be. I hate to say it, like the... Downtown cities, like when until I first, yeah, until, what's that? Until it happens to you. No, I know, but I've, I've experienced that. Um, but I still think statistically it's safer to be in LA than it is to be in, in Ohio. My sister lives in Ohio and she's, you know, the overdose, the fentanyl, the, like the, it's, it, you know, it's, an, it's a national problem. Crime is a national problem and how we handle it is, you know, part of, gotta be part of every, you know, every city mayor has to think about this in a, in a systematic way. Um, I don't have a good answer for you on that one because like the home, they're all related, right? The lack of housing pushes people into homelessness. Once you are homeless for a year, it causes mental health issues. I listened to one guy say that he had to take drugs to stay awake because if he fell asleep, he'd get beaten and have his stuff lost. Like he wasn't, so you know, this, the loop you get caught on is a, is a pernicious one and a big one, and it requires a di different big solution. But I think for me, it always starts with housing. We just need more housing. Um, that would, you know, at least that's part of my one note solution to that. But yeah, it's a big, big, good question, Carl. I just, could you give an example of a city where long-run persistence did not hold true and why? For example, Detroit. Yeah, and, the, and that's, that's my perfect example. So from Michigan, watching Detroit. So Detroit or Flint, we talked about Flint earlier. Um, you know what happened there is they were dominant by a single industry and they were unable to transition. Okay, so I think the, the place, cities that disappear are the ones that are stuck in one, one sort of technology and they're unable to make a transition, right? So... Um, LA has been interesting because you know we've gone through this huge wave of demanufacturing, right? We've exported lots of middle class jobs, lots of union jobs left, right? And it was replaced by other things. The thing that makes LA so interesting is it's really is a diverse place and it has lots of different kinds of jobs. And you know, uh, entertainment's taken up some of the slack from that and other pieces, you know. So diverse places are able to kind of move with it. Higher human capital is able to move with it better also. Um, but surprisingly, Detroit's had a little bit of a renaissance. You know, so pockets in pockets in Detroit have made the comeback. But I think that the, the short answer is that big modern metropolitan areas today are largely human capital driven, right? So let's start there. Um, and those kind of people are able to adapt generally to new kind of technologies and new businesses. And that's true. I, you know, I haven't thought hard about AI in a deep way. I'm not terrified of it yet. I don't know if anyone is, but it's certainly gonna change things. Um, it's gonna make some people more productive and some other people less productive. So there'll be some winners and losers, but um, uh, yeah, I think the Rust Belt cities, where I'm, I'm from Michigan and all the cities around there, they just they were unable to sort of think about an amenitized set to keep people to stay. Young people have left. Uh, they're not bringing new jobs. They're not bringing new industries. And so that's, that's been a problem. So I think that's the, the lack of flexibility on the human capital side is probably the biggest part. Um, but no, Detroit's my poster child for, a, you know, it was the most productive city in the world in 1958. Um, and then it wasn't. So... Um, I consider myself a native, being here for over 40 years now. But do you think we designed our downtown LA in the wrong place? Is this, nobody really <laughs> wants to stay there after work. It's ne not near the water. But I am very surprised of the Arch District, how vibrant it is. Yeah. So explain to me the dynamic oh, of I think this. It's, I think it's, sort of, it's, it's a couple of things. One is physically, the Arch District is more interesting, right? Yeah. It's just you know, the geography. The, the, the buildings are more interesting, the, or the architecture. So the, you know, the, the, it's just more fun to be there, right? Um, the office buildings are generic. They were built in the 70s and 80s, and they were boring, right? Um, they aren't heavily amenitized, and they aren't trafficked very heavily. And so they used to be trafficked a lot. There would be more sense of activity, right? But if you want activity, our district has it, right? But um, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see how we, all these cities have to work through what their excess office buildings sort of set is. There's too much office, too much old, too much building. Some of those are going to have to be torn down. Um, the guy I talked to in Phoenix yesterday is buying office buildings to tear down and put industrial there, right? So um, that's not going to make it active and activated in the way you want it to be. Um, but the, I mean, just kind of the reason I was smiling is that do you, have you ever proposed bringing downtown to Santa Monica, what they would do? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not happening. <laughs> yeah, we don't move cities. And so the best thing we can do is improve the city we got, right? It's centrally located. It's great. The nice thing about that place is everyone from LA can come there and get there in, a, in relative ease. The train system supports it now. And if it were safer and cleaner to ride, 
it would be it would be more vibrant. I'm thinking where we should invest, not downtown LA. Why not downtown LA? Why not getting That's it safe? I'm thinking. I need to be convinced that dynamics would change. But the arts district, you might be convinced. Which is which is you know part of downtown, yeah. right? Um, I remember the arts district 20 years ago was also a place you didn't want to go to, right? So this is another place where you know, safety, I think, is everything. According to your point, guys, once we get safety, I think good things will happen. And the location's too good to, to let it go bad. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Yeah.